welcome to Trippy Thursday um, with your host Ash from Kindling the Hearthfire. Um, and Trippy Thursday is turning into be more apt to name for what's going on in California than I realized, but we're actually going to be um, reading from War of the Worlds once again, uh, going on to chapter two of the second book, um, the second and final book. And the title for this particular chapter is What We Saw from the Ruined House. Okay. Everybody comfortable? Everybody got their drinks with you? Um, everybody settled? And we'll begin. After eating, we crept back into the scullery. And there I must have dozed again. For when presently I looked around, I was alone. The thudding vibration continued with wearisome persistence. I whispered for the curate several times, and I at last felt my way to the door of the kitchen. It was still daylight, and I perceived him across the room, lying against the triangular hole that looked out upon the Martians. His shoulders were hunched so that his head was hidden from me. I could hear a number of noises almost like those in an engine shed, and the place rocked with that beating thud. Through the aperture in the wall, I could see the top of a tree touched with gold and the warm blue of a tranquil evening sky. For a minute or so, I remained watching the curate, and then I advanced crouching and stepping with extreme care amid the broken crockery that littered the floor. I touched the curate's leg, and he started so violently that a mass of plaster went sliding down the outside and fell with a loud impact. I gripped his arm, fearing he might cry out, and for a long time we crouched motionless. Then I turned to see how much of our rampart remained. The detachment of the plaster had left a vertical slit open in the debris, and by raising myself cautiously across a beam, I was able to see out of this gap into what had been an overnight, had been overnight, a quiet suburban roadway. Vast indeed was the change that we beheld. The fifth cylinder must have fallen right into the midst of the house we had first visited. The building had vanished, completely smashed, pulverized, and dispersed by the blow. The cylinder lay now far beneath the original foundations, deep in a hole, already vastly larger than the pit I had looked into at walking earth all around it had splashed under that tremendous impact splashed is the only word and lay in heaped piles that hid the masses of the adjacent houses it had behaved exactly like mud under the violent blow of a hammer our house had collapsed backward the front portion even on the ground floor had been destroyed completely by chance, the kitchen and scullery had escaped, and stood buried now under soil and ruins, closed in by tons of earth on every side, save towards the cylinder. Over that aspect, we hung now in the very edge of the great circular pit the Martians were engaged in making. The heavy beating sound was evidently just behind us, and ever and again, a bright green vapor drove up like a veil across our people. The cylinder was already opened in the center of the pit, and on the, far and on the farther edge of the pit, amid the smashed and gravel-heaped shrubbery, one of the great fighting machines, deserted by its occupant, stood stiff and tall against the evening sky. At first I scarcely noticed the pit and the cylinder, although it has been convenient to describe them first. 
on account of the extraordinary glittering mechanism I saw busy in the excavation. And on account of the extraordinary glittering mechanism. And on account of the strange creatures that were crawling slowly and painfully across the heaped mold under, near it. The mechanism, it certainly was, that held my attention first. It was one of those complicated fabrics that have since been called handling machines, and the study of which has already given such an enormous impetuous to terrestrial invention. As it dawned upon me first, it presented a sort of metallic spider with five jointed agile legs and with an extraordinary number of jointed levers, bars, and reaching and clutching tentacles about its body. Most of its arms were retracted, but with three long tentacles it was fishing out with a number of rods, plates, and bars which lined the covering and apparently strengthened the walls of the cylinder. These, as it extracted them, were lifted out and deposited upon the level surface of the earth behind it. Its motion was so swift, complex, and perfect that at first I did not see it as a machine, in spite of its metallic glitter. The fighting machines were coordinated and animated to an extraordinary pitch, but nothing compared with this. People who have never seen these structures and have only the ill-imagined efforts of artists or the imperfect descriptions of such eyewitnesses as myself to go on, scarcely realize that living quality. I recall particularly the illustration of one of the first pamphlets to give a consecutive account of the war. The artist had evidently made a hasty study of one of the fighting machines, and there his knowledge ended. He presented them as tilted, stiff tripods, without either flexibility or subtlety, and with an altogether misleading monotony of effect. The pamphlet containing these renderings had a considerable vogue, and I mentioned them here simply to warn the reader against the impression they may have created. They were no more like the Martians I saw in action than a Dutch doll is like a human being, to my mind, and the pamphlet would have been much better without them. At first, I say, the handling machine did not impress me as a machine, but as a crab-like creature with a glittering integument, the controlling Martian whose delicate tentacles actuated its movements, seeming to be simply the equivalent of the crab's cerebral portion. But then I perceived the resemblance of its gray-ground, shiny, leathery integument to that of the other sprawling bodies beyond, and the true nature of this dexterous workman dawned upon me. With that realization, my interest shifted to those other creatures, the real Martians. Already I had had a transient impression of these, and the first nausea no longer obscured my observation. Moreover, I was concealed and motionless and under no urgency of action. They were, I now saw, the most unearthly creature it is possible to conceive. They were huge, round bodies, or rather heads, about four feet in diameter, each body having in front of it a face. This face had no nostrils, indeed, the Martians did not seem to have any sense of smell but it had a pair of very large, dark-colored eyes, and just beneath this kind of fleshy beak. In the back of its head or body, I was scarcely know how to speak of it, was the single tight tympanic surface, since known to be anatomically an ear, though it must have been almost useless in our dense air. In a group round the mouth, 
there were sixteen slender almost whip-like tentacles arranged in two bunches of eight each these bunches have since been named rather aptly by that distinguished anatomist professor howes the hands even as i saw these martians for the first time they seemed to be devouring endeavoring to raise themselves on these hands but of course with the increased weight of the terrestrial conditions this was impossible there is reason to suppose that on mars they may have progressed upon them with some faculty the internal anatomy the internal anatomy anatomy i may remark here as dissection has since shown was almost equally simple the greater part of the structures was the brain sending enormous nerves to the eyes ear and tactile tentacles besides this were bulky lungs into which the mouth opened and the heart and its vessels the pulmonary distress caused by the denser atmosphere and the greater gravitational attraction was only too evident in the convulsive movements of the outer skin. And this was the sum of the Martian organs. Strange as it may seem to a human being, all the complex apparatus of digestion, which makes up the bulk of our bodies, did not exist in the Martians. They were heads, merely heads. Entrails they had none. They did not eat, much less to digest. Instead, they took the fresh, living blood of other creatures and injected it into their own veins. I have myself seen this being done, as I shall mention in its place. But, squeamish as I may seem, I cannot bring myself to describe what I could not endure even to continue watching. Let it suffice to say, blood obtained from a still-living animal in most cases from a human being <coughs> in most cases from a human being was run directly into was run directly by means of a little pipette into the recipient canal the bare idea of this is no doubt horribly repulsive to us but at the same time, I think we should remember how repulsive our carnivorous habits would seem to an intelligent rabbit. The psychological, the physiological advantages of the practice of injection are undeniable. If one thinks of the tremendous waste of human time and energy occasioned by eating and the digestive process, our bodies are half made up of glands and tubes and organs occupied in turning heterogeneous food into blood. The digestive process and their reaction upon their nervous system sap our strength and color and color of our minds. Men go happy or miserable as they have healthy or unhealthy livers, or sound gastric glands. But the Martians were lifted above all these organic fluctuations of mood and emotion. <laughs> Their undeniable preference for men as their source for nourishment is partially explained by the nature of the remains of the victims they had brought with them as provisions from Mars. These creatures, to judge from the shriveled remains that have fallen into human hands, were bipeds with flimsy, siliceous skeletons, almost like those of the siliceous sponges, and feeble musculature. standing about six feet high and having round, erect heads and large eyes in flinty sockets. Two or three of these seemed to have been brought in each cylinder, and they all were killed before Earth was reached. It was just as well for them, for the mere attempt to stand upright upon our planet would have broken every bone in their bodies. And while I am engaged in this description, I may add in this place certain further details which, although they were not all evident to us at the time, will enable the reader who is 
unacquainted with them to form a clearer picture of these offensive creatures. In three other points, their physiology differed strangely from ours. Their organisms did not sleep any more than the heart of a man sleeps, since they had no extensive musculature muscular mechanisms to recuperate that periodical extinction was unknown to them they had little or no sense of fatigue it would seem on earth they could never have moved without effort yet even to the last they kept in action in 24 hours they did 24 hours of work as even on earth is perhaps the case with ants in the next place, wonderful as it seems in a sexual world, the Martians were absolutely without sex, and therefore without any of the tumultuous emotions that arise from that difference among men. A young Martian, there can be no dispute, was really born upon Earth during the war, and it was found attached to its parent, partially butted off, just as a young lily bulbs butt off, or like young animals in the freshwater polyp. In man, in all the higher terrestrial animals, such a method of increase has disappeared, but even on this earth it is was certainly the primitive method. Among the lower animals, up even to those first cousins of the bird braided animals, the tunicates, the two processes occur side by side, but finally the sexual method superseded its competitor altogether. On Mars, however, just the reverse has apparently been the case. It is worthy of remark. That a certain, certain speculative writer of quasi-scientific pute writing long before the Martians' invasion, did forecast for man a final structure not unlike the actual Martian condition. His prophecy, I remember, appeared in November or December 1893 in a long defunct pub publication, the Paul Mall Budget, and I recall a caricature of it in a pre-Martian periodical called Punch. He pointed out, writing in a foolish, facetious, facetious tone, that the perfection of mechanical appliances must ultimately supersede limbs. The perfection of chemical devices, digestion, uh, that such organs as hair, external nose, teeth, ears, and chin were no longer essential parts of the human being, and that the tendency of natural selection would lie in the direction of their steady, diminution through the coming ages. The brain alone remained a cardinal necessity. Only one other part of the body had a strong case for survival, and that was the hand, teacher and agent of the brain. While the rest of the body dwindled, the hands would grow larger. There is many a true word written in jest, and here in the Martians we have beyond dispute the actual accomplishment of such a suppression of the animal side of the organism by the intelligence. To me it is quite credible that the Martians may be descended from beings not unlike ourselves by a gradual development of the brain and hands, the latter giving rise to the two bunches of delicate tentacles at last, at the expense of the rest of the body. Without the body, the brain would, of course, become a mere selfish intelligence without any of the emotional substratum of the human being. The last salient point in which the systems of these creatures differed from ours is that was in what one might have thought a very trivial particular microorganism which caused so much disease and pain on earth 
have either never appeared upon Mars or Martian sanitary science eliminated them ages ago. A hundred diseases, all the fevers and contagions of human life, consumption, cancers, tumors, and such morbidities, never enter the scheme of their life. And speaking of the differences between life on Mars and terrestrial life, I may allude here to the curious suggestion of the red weed. Apparently, the vegetable kingdom in Mars, instead of having green for a dominant color, is a, of a vivid blood-red tint. At any rate, the seeds which the Martians intentionally or accidentally brought with them gave rise in all cases to red-colored growths. Only um, that known popularly as the red weed however, gained any footing in competition with terrestrial forms. The red creeper was quite a transistory growth, and few people have seen it growing. For a time, however, the red weed grew with astonishing vigor and luxuriance. It spread up the sides of the pit by the third or fourth day of our imprisonment, and its cactus-like branches formed a carmine fringe to the edges of our triangular window and afterwards i found it broadcast throughout the country and especially wherever there was a stream of water the martians had what appears to have been an auditory auditory organ a single round drum at the back of the head body and the eyes with a visual range not very different from ours, except that, according to Phillips, blue and violet were as black to them. It is commonly supposed that they communicated by sounds and tentacular gest gesticulations. This is asserted, for instance, in the able but hastily compiled pamphlet, written evidently by someone not an eyewitness of Martian action, to which I have already alluded, and which so far has been the chief source of information concerning them. Now no surviving human being saw so much of the Martians in actions as I did. I take no credit to myself for an accident, but the fact is so, and I assert that I watched them closely time after time, and that I have seen four, five, and once six of them, sluggishly performing the most elaborately complicated operations together without either sound or gesture. Their peculiar hooting invariably preceded feeding. It had no modulation, and I was, I believe, in no sense, as it was, and was, I believe, in no sense a signal but merely an expiration of air preparatory to the suctional operation. I have a certain claim to at least an elementary knowledge of psychology, and in this matter I am convinced, as firmly as I am convinced of anything, that the Martians interchange thoughts without physical intermediation. And I have been convinced of this in spite of strong preconceptions. Before the Martian invasion, as an occasional reader here and there may remember, I had written with some little vehemence against the telepathic theory. The Martians wore no clothing. Their conception of or ornament and decorum were necessarily different from ours and not only were they evidently much less sensible of changes of temperature than we are, but changes of pressure do not seem to have affected their health at all seriously. Yet, though they, were, they wore no clothing, it was in the other artificial additions to their bodily resources that their great superiority over man lay. We, we men, with our bicycles and road skates, our lilenthal soaring machines, our guns and sticks and so forth, are just in the beginning of the evolution that the Martians have worked out. They have become practically mere brains, wearing different bodies according to their needs, 
dressed as men's suits of clothes and take a bicycle in a hurry or an umbrella in the wet. And of their appliances, perhaps nothing is more wonderful to a man than the curious fact that what is the dominant feature of almost all human devices in mechanism is absent. The wheel is absent. Among all the things they brought to earth, there is no trace or suggestion of their use of wheels. One would have at least expected it in locomotion, and in this connection it is cautious to remark that even on the earth nature has never hit upon the wheel, or has preferred other expedients to its development. And not only did the Martians either not know of, which is incredible, or abstain from the wheel, but their apparatus, singularly little use, is made of the fixed pivot or the relatively fixed pivot with circular motions whereabout confined to one plane. Almost all the joints of the machinery present a complicated system of sliding parts moving over small but beautifully curved friction bearings. And while upon this matter of detail, it is remarkable that the long leverages of their machines are in most cases actuated by a sort of sham musculature of the discs in an elastic sheath, these discs become polarized and drawn closely and powerfully together when traversed by a current of electricity. In this way, the curious parallelism to animal motion, which was so striking and disturbing to the human beholder, was attained. Such quasi-muscles abounded in the crab-like handling machine, which, on the first peeping out of the slit, I watched unpacking the cylinder. It seemed infinitely more alive than the actual Martians lying beyond it in the sunset light panting, stirring ineffectual tentacles, and moving feebly after their vast journey across space. While I was still watching their sluggish motions in the sunlight, and noticing each strange detail of their form, the curate reminded me of his presence by pulling violently at my arm. I turned to a scowling face and a silent, eloquent lips. He wanted the slit, which permitted only one of us to peep through, and so I had to forego watching them for a time while he enjoyed that privilege. When I looked again, the busy handling machine had already put together several pieces of the apparatus it had taken out of the cylinder into a shape having the unmistakable likeness to its own, and down on the left, a busy little digging mechanism had come into view emitting jets of green vapor and working its way around the pit, excavating and embanking in a methodical and discriminating manner. This it was which caused the regular beating noise and the rhythmic shocks that kept our ruinous refuge quivering. It piped and whistled as it worked. So far as I could see, the thing was without a directing Martian at all. And that is the end of chapter two. Hope everyone has it, is having a very good evening and hope everybody is staying safe, especially those of us who are in California and are among the people affected by the fires. As you can, I can't probably see it in the window, but it's kind of got a yellowish, kind of grayish haze all over it. And why the sun rose at all yesterday so thank you all for popping in i hope you have a fabulous thursday and stay safe and we will see you tomorrow with our fairy tale friday once again at eight o'clock either on facebook youtube or on audio with our um podcast so see everyone later and have a lovely evening